I'd like to think that this channel covers a lot of the niche lore that other channels don't get to, and this topic is definitely something you won't have heard explored before. Bizarrely though, I would say this is also one of the most important topics in Warhammer 40k right now. We're gonna talk about the Golden Throne and its Dark Twin. In a way, it doesn't matter how many Primarchs come back, it doesn't matter how many holes Abaddon puts in the galaxy. If the Golden Throne fails, everything fails. The Emperor would die or ascend, it doesn't really matter, because without him, Chaos Demons would overwhelm the planet, the Astronomicon would be lost, and the Emperor couldn't direct it anymore, and so the ships of the Imperium could no longer travel between systems easily, and so the worlds of humanity would eventually be torn apart by the Chaos and Xenos threats. It would be just like the Age of Strife, we would be in the age of not very good stuff. The throne is not really as you imagine. Firstly, this picture, whilst epic, doesn't do the sheer size of the Golden Throne justice. It's about the size of a city. This is also not really what you would see if you walked into the chamber 10,000 years later. For most beings, if you entered that room you would die within seconds. The bright light of the Emperor, the sheer amount of radiation coming from the machines that sustain the Golden Throne, or the warp currents that rage in that room would destroy you. Theories of the Golden Throne failing have persisted for a while, but they were properly explored in the Vaults of Terror trilogy by Chris Raitt, truly a heavyweight writer within Black Library. I'm going to try and get you up to speed as quickly as I can, but firstly, an important misconception about the Golden Throne is that it was made during humanity's dark age of technology. Now it is true that its origin is a mystery, however, we know that its core components are not human. They are covered in Xenos markings and runes. And we still don't really know what the original purpose of these components was. I believe the Old Ones probably created them to help construct the webway. The Emperor took these components and a thousand stolen artifacts from older races. From these, he adapted the throne, and then he created a subsystem to allow a human being to operate it. Despite more souls being sacrificed and more power being fed to the throne, it appears that the Imperium does not have the necessary technology to fix its most important device, and so it may be forced to look outwards for aid. Even the custodians don't properly understand how this big golden chair actually works. The maintenance and running of the throne falls to the Adeptus Mechanicus, and it is a principal duty of the Fabricator General of Mars, who is also a High Lord of Terror, to ensure that it does not fail. The Fabricator General during these events was called U Udia Raskian, and he is essentially one of the most powerful beings in the Imperium. To look at him, you might just see a very short man. However, you would then notice there are various pipes and wires connecting him to gigantic databanks. He is basically a walking, talking building. Raskian says that for the last 537 years, they have been investigating specific faults and components are failing. In the book, he gives a maximum of 200 years before the throne fails utterly. Now, Raskian could have just raised this issue during the next High Lords of Terror meeting, and this would mean that surely it would have become a priority, right? Well, in typical Martian fashion, the Fabricator General ran an intensive psychopolitical analysis of the composition of the current council. The analysis concluded that only two of the other High Lords would have supported the necessary action, and this was a risk that Raskian simply could not take. Therefore, another plan was needed. Now, if you are in charge of a major conspiracy, you're going to want to make sure you have good internet privacy, and that is where the sponsor for today's video, Surfshark VPN, comes in. Surfshark VPN keeps your identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. 
This keeps your data protected from big companies and cyber criminals. Masking your IP is essential for online privacy. Surfshark's clean web feature blocks ads, trackers, malware and phishing attempts, providing you with safe browsing. Surfshark does not monitor, track or store any of your online activities, meaning that no connection or activity logs are kept. Also, a VPN can be used to swap out the location of your device for another location of your choosing. So for example, I wanted to watch The Fast and the Furious, the first one, when it was still about street racing. Now this is not on the UK Netflix, however, I can very quickly switch my location to the US and by refreshing my browser, I can see it's on the American Netflix. And so there we have it, family. So get an exclusive Surfshark deal today and remember promo code SANDMAN for an additional 3 months off. Surfshark offers a free 30 day money back guarantee so you really have nothing to lose. It's worth noting that Raskian's analysis is kind of proved correct as he gains the support of two other High Lords of Terror. Conspiring with him is the Speaker of the Chartist Captains, who eventually backs out, and the Master of the Astronomicon, who dies during the series. The first plan of Raskian and his allies did not end very well. Unable to fix the throne using any servant of the Emperor, he turns to another race, the Drukhari. They had the radical Inquisitor Razalo bring a Drukhari homunculus to the throne world. The creature escaped and caused absolute havoc on the throne world before being found by Inquisitor Crowl of the Ordo Hereticus. The homunculus was finally slain by members of the Adeptus Custodes, led by Navradaran. The Custodians are the guardians of the Master of Mankind. They are the finest super soldiers in the Imperium and for the last 10,000 years had rarely been seen outside of the Imperial Palace. However, a fun fact about the Drukhari, and this is vital for this tale, is that they can actually die many times. Komara, their dark city within the webway, has a very unique facility. Here, they can use a single drop of blood to return them to life. And this is no ordinary clone, for the soul will be pulled back and placed into the body. Unfortunately for Inquisitor Crowl, during these events, his blood mixed with that of the homunculus. This appears to have binded the two together, and over time, Crowl starts to lose his mind. He also increasingly resembled the Xenos race. From here out, Crowl, his interrogator Spinoza and their retinue start to uncover this conspiracy, and after they discover just how high up it goes, Eventually, along with another Inquisitor, Zyges, they find themselves on Luna, Terra's moon. There, they discover a webway gate, the same webway gate used to bring Robute Gilliman to the Soul System, as well as Magnus the Red and his thousand sons. The battle for Luna may have been over, but it was in turmoil. Nine custodians arrive shortly after. Navradaran leading them. They were fresh from battle, as it turns out, the entire Imperium is in disarray. Not only had Magnus the Red invaded, but in the wake of the Great Rift's formation, Corn Demons had invaded Terra, and Gilliman was forced to lead the Imperial forces to strike back. Yet despite the throne world reeling from these events, the custodians had been tracking down Kral's inquisitorial retinue, also wanting to uncover the plans of the Fabricator General. These allies entered the webway, where they ultimately located Raskian. After the failure of his first plan, he had pressed on. He established a reconnection with the Drukhari, and he and his delegation had gone into the webway to strike a deal with the Xenos. The Drukhari would deliver the components required to fix the throne. They would even provide instructions. The custodians and the inquisitorial forces arrived just before the exchange would take place. This forced Raskian to tell them the true danger 
to the Imperium. The Golden Throne is failing, and the Drukhari are their only hope. So the question is, of course, why would the Drukhari do this? Raskian tells the Inquisitors that 19 billion souls have been offered. A system will have all of its defenses pulled away, so they can raid and pillage at will. The Dark Eldar also say their motives are pure, for humanity must survive. The Drukhari are parasites after all, and so don't want to see the human race extinguished, for they need to feed. However, this reasoning does not sit right with Inquisitor Crowl. So as the exchange is about to begin, he finds Drukhari mirror technology, and due to the blood in his veins, he can now use this device. He peers inside and into the dark city of Komara itself. They were building something down there. Millions of thralls, thousands of constructor machines, all conjuring and reshaping and summoning. More esoteric vehicles were hovering above that one site than anywhere else he'd seen so far. An air of panic hung over the place. Just like every edifice he'd witnessed, the scale was incredible. This was an immense effort, a huge program, something launched in desperation and panic. Its work continuing and expanding even as it came under repeated attack. As all of this was going on, he saw the Drukhari fighting, fighting against the Neverborn, the demons. Something fundamental had shattered around Komara, and then he recognized it. He saw the familiar tangle of components, the same frantic mix of arcane devices, all linked together in a forest of mind-bending complexity, a counterpart to the more ancient machine, now being constructed anew even as he watched. They needed this thing for the same reason that the Imperium needed it. The warp had erupted under Komara, and they needed a way to stop it. And now he was speeding into the very core of it, and at the very centre of the immense conglomeration, locked down under layer after layer of supporting structures, was a seat. A black throne, woven around with eldritch runes and psychic connectors, larger than any Xenos could ever have sat in, already bursting with contained energies even before the machine was fully operational. I know what they want, he thought, with a sudden awful clarity. Holy terror! I know what they want! Interestingly, the custodians were actually going to allow the exchange to go ahead. For as terrible as it is to work with the Xenos, it would be far worse to let the Emperor die. However, Krau's discovery here would change everything, and so he immediately heads to where Raskian and Archon Shea Morvain of the Cabal of the Still Living Knife are in the middle of the exchange. The Drukhari will provide a casket of replacement tech, and the Imperium will hand over the technical samples for the Xenos to work from. However, Crowl barges in just before the exchange completes. Cease! Stop this now! A voice rang out across the chamber, startling Spinoza into silence. Her head snapped round to see Crowl striding out into the center of the chamber, the narrow no man's land between the two delegations. He had his pistol drawn. Reavers and Kazad came to him, also bearing weapons. He looked absolutely furious, wilder and angrier than she had ever seen him before. Dark veins bulged underneath his parchment-thin skin, and what remained of his hair fell about his face in greasy clumps. Detain him, ordered Raskian, and fifty Skitari instantly moved to comply. Hold, ordered Navradaran, 
and he gestured to his companions. Two of them, moving faster than any of the tech guard, smoothly interposed themselves between the parties, shielding crowd from assault. By then, the Xenos had reacted too. What is this? demanded the Archon, her voice still emerging from a fractional delay through the translexes. No more obstructions. All has been determined. No, he will be heard, countered Navradaran, striding down from his high position and to the forefront of the Imperial lines. All around him, Militarum and Skitari zeroed their weapons at the Xenos ranks. Two further custodians moved into position to protect Crowl, leaving four standing vigil close to the caskets. It suddenly felt like one false move, one twitchy trigger finger, might bring the whole thing crashing down around them. You have been deceived, Crowl shouted across the chamber, flecks of blood and spittle flying from his mouth. He looked deranged, a true madman at last. Do not open that thing. By the Emperor's name, I shall kill the first one who tries. All is ordained, Inquisitor, said Raskian. You are clearly unwell. Withdraw now, and you shall not face further sanction. Crowl didn't listen. He barely seemed aware of the Fabricator General's presence. To the extent he was talking to anyone now, it was Navradaran. They have made their own, their own throne. I have seen it, I have seen the work on it, and it is nearly finished. He stretched out a clawed hand, pointing at the Archon in denunciation. All lies. You said you wished to keep us alive. Maybe true, but this was never about us, was it? It was about you. Then Crowl whirled around to face the custodian again. Their city is under attack. Just like Terra, just like everywhere else. They are reeling. They are losing. The warp is spilling through every crack in their defenses. And they need a way to staunch the flow. He began to choke, to throw up blood spatters, but forced himself to keep going. And that is what the throne does, isn't that right? It guards against destruction. It holds back the flood. It is the last, the best shield against the ruin of the universe. He turned on Raskian at last, eyes staring, cloak flying out wildly. And you taught them how, he shouted bitterly. Everything you have given them. All those exchanges of data and schematics. They already know so much more than we do. And we gave away the few scraps they couldn't work out themselves. You did it, my lord. You sold your birthright cheaply. The tech priests start chattering nervously, sending tight bursts of binaric to one another. The caskets, so close to meeting, began to pull back their stasis fields re-establishing. This is irrelevant, the Archon protested. What is or is not the case in Komara is none of your concern. We have here a simple exchange of goods, one that has been scrutinized over and over again. There is no risk to your Imperium in this. It must conclude, or our guarantees of protection here become void. Crowl laughed a horrible stretched sound. None of our concern? None of our concern? You bolt together a cheap mockery of our holiest place and call it none of our concern. He took an ominous step towards the Xenos ranks, looking as if he wished to charge straight into them. Because you have been lying from the very start. All of it lies. Your witch there even said it to my face. He said the emperor we place so much store by is entirely irrelevant to the machine's ongoing function. And as soon as he told me that, I knew something was wrong. Because I have been there. I have stood at the very doors of eternity and felt the power 
of his matchless will in motion. So do not tell me that he is irrelevant, because he is everything. He powers it and he guides us. Without his unspeakable sacrifice, we are all of us consigned to damnation. And those who are not already heretics know it. A throne is nothing without a king. Now the custodians were becoming more active. At some unspoken signal, their weapons moved into guard. Raskian started to get agitated, and Morskitari shuffled to protect the retreating caskets. The Xenos, by contrast, looked furious, all save the witch creature, who merely observed with something like cool detachment. Complete the transaction, the Archon said, speaking directly to Raskian. I say it again, what happens in Komara has no bearing on this deal, the Archon said, speaking directly to Raskian. Oh, but it does, said Crowl, now grinning dementedly, pacing back and forth like an advocate before the accused. Because there is one thing you do not have, one faculty that has withered you into nothing. You are masters of the material realm, that is certain. You are the destroyers of stars and the devourers of worlds, but you cannot stomach the warp. You have built a throne, but you cannot use it. You have made the seat, but cannot sit in it. Even the greatest of your kind, at the height of your race's dominance, would have struggled to occupy that machine. And now, none of you is strong enough for it. It is useless to you, a waste of all your sweat and toil. Unless, that is, you create an emperor of your own. What Crowl realized here is not just that the Drukhari are building their own version of the Golden Throne, the Dark Throne but that they are going to clone the Emperor using the facility mentioned before. For within the samples that the Imperium was about to hand over will be trace amounts of the Emperor's biological material. And as we have learned, that is all they would need to create an abhorrent copy of his immortal might. That agonized lump of flesh would be forced to channel its psychic might to protect Komara and ensure that the demonic invasions cease. However, for the custodians, mightiest of the Emperor's servants, this abomination cannot be allowed. The Golden Warriors strike first, but the Drukhari respond quickly, as do the rest of the Imperials. Anarchy ensues, and the custodians destroy the casket to ensure that this ultimate blasphemy does not occur. Crowl and Spinoza realize that word of what has happened here must get back to the Imperium. They fight their way back through the webway, hoping to find a gate that will take them to Imperial space, back to safety. But this is the grim darkness of the far future. Every single member is seemingly lost or slain in the fighting, and I hope for their sake the Drukhari didn't take any prisoners. Only the servo skull Gorgias makes it out, though we do not know what world he has landed on, or if anyone will ever hear his message. Not all hope is lost for the throne, however. For we do know that the Custodians are aware of its failing, and that Captain General Trajan Valoris has tasked Shield Captain Heraclast of Adrian to look for a solution to save the Master of Mankind. He assembles a group of his finest warriors and embarks on a quest for the lost forge world of Morvain. I'm fascinated to see where this storyline is going, and I'll be sure to update you as it continues. So please do consider subscribing to the channel, it really does make a difference. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and remember to check out Surfshark VPN through the link in my description. I'll see you next time.